Okay. All right. I think we're good. All right. Hi, guys. My name is Fatai. I'm a hospitalist in South Carolina. Um, I'm here again with my friend Mubarak Yusuf uh, to talk about some of the things that we encounter in internal medicine, in my case as a hospitalist, in this case as a, as a resident. Uh, so today we'll be talking about some uh, topics that have to do with um, you know, end of life and a little bit of critical care as well. Um, so I'll let Mubarak introduce himself. Hi, my name is Mubarak, uh, first year here in Bronx, New York. I'm here to get uh, again with my friend, my mentor, to uh, share some uh, interesting topic and also to learn from him. All right, so um, I'll level back because the, the question that started this conversation, this particular one, was about um, end of life care and how that kind of connects a little bit with even resuscitation. I mean, when do you initiate that conversation? And uh, we'll also talk about some of the most important things about resuscitation and, you know, uh, post uh, uh, cardiac arrest management. So, Mubarak, which, whichever one you want to start with, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I think we should start with the uh, uh, post cardiac arrest. Okay. You know, so, after we talk about the post cardiac arrest, then we can walk to uh, end of life care. You know? mm -hmm. Because, yeah, I think that will uh, be all right. All right, sounds good. So, in, you know, again, uh, it, it's, it's important to have all of these things in complete perspective, to have all of it in, you know, a good framework. And uh, there is no post cardiac arrest management without what you do in the resuscitation itself. So it's important to have all of those things uh, structured. So again, you know, unfortunately, patients become um, asystole. They go into asystole and then, you know, the, the response or in different facilities, it probably be a code blue, or a code 99. And that is called the people that are resuscitating get to the bedside Initially, that you have the nurse and all of, uh, and uh, you have the nurse at the bedside, probably already started uh, chest compressions. So you go through all of that, all of the important things about resuscitation, knowing that the primary thing about resuscitation is the chest compression. You don't want to, you don't want to be messing with that at all. That has to be going while you're trying to do everything else. Obviously, if the patient is not already intubated, you're trying to, you know, take control of the airway, and you're doing that while you're doing the chest compressions, you're running through your, air, your head, all of the things that might have caused that, and you're trying to reverse all of the, the things you could potentially reverse. You're looking at the labs, you know, saying, you know, what was the most recent lab for this patient? What was their, you know, potassium? What was their calcium? Uh, what was their, you checking finger stick at the best side to say, you know, can I potentially reverse this by just giving glucose? Uh, uh, you're checking their bicarb, you know, to kind of get a sense of, whether or maybe it were important to give bicarb in that case. And then you're doing everything that you normally do with your, you know, uh, 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 cardiac arrest, uh, 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 resuscitation, you know, your epi every two to three minutes, you know, you're checking pulse about every two minutes and you're looking at the rhythm to see if this is a shockable or non-shockable rhythm. And it's all of these things that we do in cardiac arrest that I think people should already internalize because that's really what makes a difference. So for example, if you're talking about post cardiac arrest management and you've missed a good chunk of time with solid chest compressions, then you know the recovery is not going to be as good. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize here because your recovery, the patient's recovery and you know resuscitation and post cardiac arrest you know, outcomes is very strongly tied to what happens in the resuscitation process. A lot of times you find, you know, uh, they're trying to intubate a patient, you know, they're already on BVM, you're already bagging them, and they we take a long time to pause compressions while somebody's trying to take control of the airway. I'm not saying it's easy to intubate a patient who um, uh, is getting chest compression, but you have to know what is more important than that. In that case, in, again, in cardiac arrest, you just really want to not break the chest compressions. As, as You want to limit that as, as much as you possibly can. And hopefully with a skilled person who can intubate while all of that is going on, you know, you, you're probably going to get the best outcome. Now, you achieved, a uh, uh, patient uh, had returned to uh, spontaneous circulation. You achieved uh, uh, ROSC, you know, 
you recycle the vitals, you looked at the rhythm, everything is looking, you know, potentially okay. Meaning they have a good blood pressure, they have a good heart rate, you know, they're not breathing down any longer and they're not in some crazy arrhythmia. Uh, you, you kind of feel like you got this patient back. And that's, that's, that's incredible. That's just, you know, out of this world in terms of how important uh, that could be. Now you have to think about how do you achieve the best outcome? Again, what you have to think strongly about is what most likely cause a cardiac arrest in the first place. Because if you bring the patient out of the cardiac arrest and you don't fix the thing that caused the cardiac arrest, what's going to happen? They're going to go back into, you know, asystole. So you want to be, you want to be very, you know, very exact as to what caused that. So you do, you're trying to, in the immediate period after resuscitation, you don't want to be moving the patient around. So if, let's say, for example, you're suspecting that this patient probably had uh, 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 a PE, you really can't immediately get the patient to, you know, CAT scan to check for that in that immediate period. It depends on how stable the patient may be. But if, if, if the patient is just hanging on, like just barely hanging on, maybe that's not the best time to move that patient, you know, uh, to CT scan. It's always important it's always important to try to get some form of imaging right after cardiac arrest. For example, you want to make sure there's no bleed in the head. If you tie that back, for example, to you know, pulmonary embolism, you're not going to be able to start that patient on anticoagulation if you haven't confirmed that there is no bleeding in the head. And sometimes, you know, depending on how long the cardiac arrest for, was for, you may be able to, it's not all the time, you may be able to get a sense of uh, uh, how much anoxic brain injury might have happened, you know, in that process. The, the CT scan, uh, uh, picking up soft tissue changes doesn't happen that quickly, but sometimes you, you find evidence that, wow, there's been some de significant degree of anoxic brain injury in this patient. But outside of all of that, the most important thing, the most important thing you're trying to achieve uh, with this patient particularly, is controlling the temperature. Controlling the temperature, uh, 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 therapeutic temperature uh, uh, monitoring or management, what some people will call hypothermia protocol. It's important you do that. The reason why is, of all of the things that you could potentially do uh, post cardiac arrest, you know, Hypothermic protocol is probably one of the ones that have the better, the better outcomes. And you don't want to miss out on that and potentially facilitate more brain damage. So you want to be as, as proactive regarding that as possible. Now, are there contraindications to, to therapeutic temperature management or uh, hypothermic protocol, protocol? There are contraindications to hypothermic protocol. Uh, one of the main and absolute contraindications to uh, um, uh, 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 hypothermic protocol would be a patient who is DNR, for example. Meaning, in the process, you might might have, and this is going to tie to our conversations about end of life care and you know the conversation with family. While in the process of resuscitation, is usually very important that somebody already picked up the phone to start the conversation with the family. You're literally getting them involved. Obviously, obviously, the mistake people make a lot of times is when a patient comes comes into the ICU, we don't initiate, we don't give them a, a range of expectations, things to expect in the ICU. Obviously, a patient coming to the ICU is already very sick, and the chances that they make it out of the ICU is not. It's it's, it's a lot of times it's very slim. So if you just, you know, ignore all of that and say, you know what, well, let's just stop management, let's not worry about anything else, you know, we'll uh, do whatever, whatever, when the time comes, you would lose a lot of ground in getting the patient's family involved, for example. But again, cardiac arrest can happen anywhere, even on the floors, and a, a patient that is stable, for example, could just all of a sudden go into cardiac arrest. The patient could be coming from, you know, outside the hospital in cardiac arrest. So again, it, it doesn't mean that you would have by all means, in every cardiac arrest situation, started the conversation before. Let's just say you're in that process of the resuscitation. It's important that somebody picks up the phone, starts to talk to the family, tell them what is happening, be as frank as possible while you're trying to also be as compassionate as possible. 
But at the same time, I want to be very clear as to what is likely to happen and then what the family's wishes will be regarding what the patient, I mean, in, in connection to what they know uh, the patient might have wanted to, to begin with. But anyways, all of that aside, um, I, I went off from talking about the contraindications to uh, hypothermia protocol. So again, a patient who's DNR, for example, you were in the process of resuscitation, you, the family kind of made the decision, you know what, no more resuscitation, but somehow you got the patient back in the middle of that. That patient probably shouldn't be put on a hypothermia protocol. That happens a lot. It happens quite often. And, you know, you're, somehow the patient achieves, you know, uh, ROSC and then the family saying, you know what, let's just make the patient, you know, DNR. Let's not do this again. All right. That kind of a patient should not necessarily be put on um, hypothermia protocol. The second important reason why patients shouldn't be put on a hypothermia protocol, if they have any purposeful movement right after the resuscitation, meaning, for example, they're opening their eyes, they're moving, they're grimacing, you, you don't have the, it, it means that there's some significant brain function, you know, uh, after, after the cardiac arrest. So you don't have to put that kind of a patient on um, hypo, place that kind of patient on, on the hypothermia protocol. Um, the other, this is a little bit relative in terms of uh, uh, contraindications to hypothermia protocol. When patients have a non-compressible bleed, so for example, a bleed in the brain, and that's why it's important to get an imaging, you know, right after cardiac arrest, just to kind of get a sense of, for example, what might have caused it, and if there is a bleed in the brain. You get what I mean? Now, the mistake I see a lot of, you know, I made at some point too, is to say, you know what, they're not DNR, they're not having any purposeful movement, so I should start hypothermia protocol. But then I say, you know what, let me get imaging to confirm there is no bleed first before I start. And then it takes a while to get that imaging. You're losing ground on the recovery. So you shouldn't stop, you shouldn't say, for example, don't get image, I mean, wait to get imaging before you start hypothermic protocol because you want to confirm at least start the hypothermic protocol. You get what I mean? And then go and get your imaging. If there's a reason to stop it, you stop it. If there is no reason to stop it, you go ahead and continue. Meaning a reason to stop will be, for example, um, uh, uh, a, a non-compressible bleed. And then most, most facilities have the guidelines for the hypothermic protocol, how much sedative should, be, should they be on, um, the temperature control. So sometimes you might have to give Tylenol to control the fever and try to keep it within you know, the range that you expect it to be. And, and so many different things as well. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, it's important to consider all of these things as part of the post-cardiac arrest management. You want to look for what caused it. You want to make sure there is no bleed in the brain. You want to have had or at least initiate significant uh, 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 goals of care with the family. But above all of these things, hypothermic protocol, you know, uh, takes, you know, it's, it's, it's more important because if you're going to achieve better recovery, that's your best bet. That's your best chance. And while you do all of the other things. So I think that probably covers um, uh, some of the most important points that I would like to share about post cardiac arrest management, I, I don't know if you had any any follow ups on that. Oh wow, that's uh, that's pretty comprehensive. All right, it's just the that you said uh, when the chest compression is going on or after chest compression, if the patient does have some purposeful movement, yeah, then you know, I've actually been long after chest compression, the patient. Yeah. Okay, you know what. I think this is a fine. We we'll still send the patient to the ICU for monitoring, and then the patient actually came out fine and good after some days. So, so Mubarak, say, say that part again. I think it, the connection was breaking up from the last part. So, I, so uh, after chest compression, right, what happened was that the patient was waiting their hands, right, and we were like, wait, did this patient actually did have a cardiac arrest? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that happens a lot, right? The patient at the ICU. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and luckily, the oh. patient... The patient came back okay, I think is what you're trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, oh, and this is a very important point too. I've seen a lot of times where um, there is a supposed cardiac arrest, maybe like a two-minute cardiac arrest, and patient comes back okay, almost like talking to you actually. Mm -hmm. 
Do not get yeah. carried away. That patient, if you're, if that is happening on the floors, move that patient to the ICU. You get I me? Mean? Because you could be ten- tempted because nobody wants to move a patient somewhere else. You could be tempted to say, you know what? Oh, they're fine. Maybe they didn't have a cardiac arrest, blah, 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 blah. Watch the patient. If the patient were to code again there, that would be a big problem for you. You understand what I'm saying? So if, if you have even a, something that looks like a cardiac arrest that you're not entirely sure that it was, you're better off moving that patient to the IC and making sure, you know, they, I, I think most facilities have a protocol like that where they wouldn't, even, the nurses wouldn't even let you do that. <laughs> you get what yeah. I mean? This is what even let you do leave a patient that you supposedly just resuscitated on, you know, even like a step down unit. They're not gonna let you do that. You get what I mean? They will. You should have that kind of patient in ICU, um, even if they were, for example, talking to you after the cardiac arrest. I've seen, I, and a lot of times <laughs> you've seen patients become completely unresponsive, and the nurse goes and checks on the patient. Maybe the patient was just in some crazy deep sleep or they were knocked out by medication and the nurse cannot feel a pulse for some reason and they start just conversions <laughs> and then the patient wakes up and say wait i was just sleeping maybe after one minute of chest, chest compression so that's important to be sure about as well because you don't always have the rhythm or you know be able to say for sure they were in asystole it's just because the nurse said you know i couldn't feel a pulse and i started just compression so it's important to have that in mind as well but i think that's uh that's uh that's a a good place to wrap this part up just i want to give a shout out to one of the medical right uh we have you want to give a shout out to to a medical student uh, just do an elective in Jamaica, right? In Jamaica. And uh, we have and what happened was that suddenly crashed, right? And the nurse was like, the patient crashed. And I was like, who's this patient? Whose patient is it? And then we're like, okay, let's start chest compression. Yeah. That guy gave a very effective chest compression. We got the patient back in four minutes. Wow. Wow. Know? Wow. Like, Ross is back in four minutes. Right. But, yeah, so. but, 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 but again, it, it tells you what is important with cardiac arrest. You understand? That's it tells true. you what is important with cardiac arrest. The chest compression is a big deal. Yeah. It's the biggest of all deals. You get what I mean? Do not do anything to compromise that. Do everything you're supposed to do. You need to pay the patient. You need to, you know, get the lines in. You know, you're trying to do IO and somebody's saying, wait, don't do chest compression because I'm just... Keep doing your chest compression. Get your IO however you get it. Somebody's trying to do a femoral line while the chest compression... Let them get it however they get it. Keep the chest compressions going. Mm-hmm. Because, yes, you could pause technically for about 10 seconds. But if you don't have to, you don't have to. And I think most experienced people will be able to get an IO while all of that is going on. You know, a lot of the, you know, very skilled, line, handy people will be able to get a femoral line while that is going on. A lot of very skilled people will be able to get uh, the tube down uh, while that is going on. So I think, again, chest compression is a massive deal. I won't encourage anybody to compromise that in the in the for the sake of something else. Again, if if you have a hypoxic patient that most likely when you cardiac arrest because of hypoxia, intubation, intubating that patient is like really, really up there in terms of importance. But again, you want to make sure that you don't compromise chest compression because of that, right? You, th- you think that's a good place that- uh, Yeah, I think that's it. All right, sounds good. So we'll, we'll go to the next question. So we'll see you guys on the next video. Uh, 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 keep, 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 working keep studying keep being the best of of you know what you can you know keep being the best possible physician clinician if there are any you know nurse practitioners physician assistants or whoever and watching students this. and students right yeah keep being the best of what you possibly can so we'll, we'll see you guys on the next video bye all right bye